gospel according to Matthew. <coughs> to ten bridesmaids who took their torches and went out to welcome the groom. Five of them were foolish, while the other five were sensible. The foolish ones, in taking their tor torches, brought no oil along. But the sensible ones took flasks of oil as well as their torches. The groom delayed his coming, so they all began to nod and then to fall asleep. At midnight, someone shouted, The groom is here. Come out and greet him. At the outcry, all the virgins woke up and got their torches ready. The foolish ones said to the sensible, Give us some of your oil. Our torches are going out. But the sensible ones replied, No, there may not be enough for you and for us. You had better go to the dealers and buy yourself some. While they went off to buy it, the groom arrived. And the ones who were ready went in to the wedding with him. When the door was barred, later the other bridesmaids came back. Master, master, they cried, open the door for us. But he answered, I tell you, I do not know you. The moral is, keep your eyes open, for you know not the day nor the hour. This is the Gospel of the Lord. I'm giving your attention. At this point, we begin our ceremony. I'm sorry. Hosea. This prophet is known for the ardor of his love for Yahweh, and he's also known because of a very unfaithful wife. And the prophecy has to do with its first understanding, besides its future fulfillment. In its first understanding, it had to do with the, the forgiveness which God was willing to accord to his people who somehow resembled the prophet's wife. The people had been unfaithful again and again. And now, by means of God's mercy about to be shown towards them, he gave them this reassurance of his willingness to espouse them. That is, the people of Israel was considered espoused of Yahweh. But uh, that was only partially fulfilled in that time because it had a prophetic dimension still to be fulfilled with greater fullness in Christ and in his church and in the very kind of ceremony that we are now taking part in. We are gathered then in this house of God, in the throne room of the Most High, to witness and to celebrate nuptials. Nuptials, however, surrounded with mystery. Surrounded with mystery, I say, joyful, love and life-filled nuptials, yet indeed surrounded with mystery. There are no members of your natural families here present. There are no earthly bridegrooms that can be seen with visible eyes. To understand what is going on, and even to believe that this is truly a marriage requires strong faith, faith based not upon human testimony, but on divine testimony. There are not as many grooms present as there are maidens to become espoused, or 
of those to confirm their espousals previously made by the renewal of their profession. There is but one bridegroom, and he is the son of the living God and the Lord of the universe. We are in the presence here of a profound, unique, spiritual reality. Your bridegroom is also your creator, and you are his creatures. He is your redeemer who liberated you from sin, and you are the ones at once, at one time, under the reign of sin and now belonging to the reign of the kingdom of God. He, your bridegroom, is the source of your life that outlasts earthly life or existence. He is the pledge of your resurrection from the dead. He is the guarantor of eternal life. He is the object of all your love, who gives you of the fullness of his love. And that love is human and divine. Because you believe this, and are willing to give all you are and have to gain this favor from God, as Mary was favored by God, for that reason you are here. You are ready and willing, as you said to the mouth of the reader, Here am I, Lord. I come to do your will. In your minds and hearts and on your lips are these words, Here am I, Lord. I come. I come with haste to do your will. We examine the endowments of the bridegroom and then turn our attention to the brides themselves. And here we keep our text before us. In that same letter, or rather the prophecy of Hosea, we learn something of the methods of the bridegroom. We find in the first place that he makes use of his attractiveness, makes use of it for the good purpose of drawing you to himself. I will allure her. I will lead her in, into the desert and speak to her heart. It is precisely because he is son of God and son of man who contains the fullness and the perfection of humanity in his own nature, at the same time the fullness of the Godhead, that to those who have faith he is indeed totally attractive to them. Those who have a sense of sin and have repented of sin suddenly see in the light of faith the divine attractiveness of him who is son of man and son of God. There is a theater or place where these nuptials are to take place. The scriptures call it the desert. They will lead her into the desert. The desert naturally is a symbol of a place apart, a place where there is privacy, a place where the purpose of nuptials may more easily and fully be realized. And that place is indeed here at this moment, but it is not reserved just to a chapel. In this case it is also the world, but the world which by reason of your faith and of this calling becomes a place apart in the symbolic sense, a place where it is possible despite the presence of evil and the ways quite contrary to the ways of faith are also to be recognized and yet just as Mary going through the countryside from Nazareth down to Ein Karim below Jerusalem bore her divine son tabernacled in her womb as Lord and Savior of the world he was going out into the world still indeed enclosed within his mother's womb but at the same time 
beginning his apostolic journey in and through her was to give witness to what took place within her. And uh, it is there that he was already bestowing blessings upon those people who lived here and there, some of them believers, others not. It is upon his arrival that he sanctified his cousin, John the Baptist, not even born as yet, and was the cause of his mother, Elizabeth, to be filled with the Holy Spirit and to prophesy. The place of the nuptials then is indeed the desert where you have daily and constantly rendezvous with your bridegroom who goes with you as he was carried by his own mother, goes with you anywhere and everywhere in which he leads you. There is to be considered also, or to be reflected upon, the method that he used to draw you. The text tells us that he said, I will speak to her heart. In other words, to address her in that which pertains to the very depth of her being, speak to her heart, in order to elicit, besides the faith, to believe the totality of her love, so as to receive from her the yes, the consent, for what he has in mind for her, what he is offering her, namely a spousal. As far as the nature of the espousals are concerned, there are two things to be regarded. One has to do with the kind of espousals that he is calling you to, and then the effect upon yourself. I will espouse you in right and in justice. Now, God is the author, the possessor of complete and total right both his truth and his conduct his ways of doing things are all of them just and right we would not even know what true rightness or righteousness is if it were not for God's existence he is the one who reveals to us himself in which we discover the source of all that is right so he will espouse you in right and also in justice. The term justice here in the biblical sense means holiness because God is, uh, as he is the source of all that is right, is the source of holiness. As a result then of this espousal with you, you can and you have a right to expect that you will grow both in the knowledge and in the performance of what is right and that you will also grow in holiness which you derive from and in which you are sustained by your spouse, the author of all holiness. The method I already mentioned, that of speaking to your heart, to your innermost being, where it will be most effective. Note also that he says, I will espouse you in love and in mercy. God himself is love, so that means his whole being will be placed at your disposal in order to transform your merely human and imperfect love to a share in his divine love. He will also espouse you in mercy, meaning that since you are a mere human creature, have been and still have to battle against human weaknesses, that his love will take on the form of mercy, of condescension, of forgiveness, if you were to offend him at any time. It's the reassurance, as you were reassured last night in your penance service, that no matter how often you may have in the past or even will in the future, much as you are resolved to avoid deliberate sin, but if it should happen that the mercy of God, which is the expression of his condescending love, will be extended to you because you are his spouse. You wish indeed to be the faithful spouse. That brings us to another aspect of this same spousal relationship, which is contained in this same brief reading, I will espouse you in fidelity. 
that particular aspect of God's relationship with his human creatures and more particularly with those to whom he has given the kind of vocation that you have is one which is celebrated again and again throughout the whole Old Testament God's way of dealing with his human creatures if he promises something he will keep it he is faithful and always will be faithful faithful to himself because of the promise that he made he who knows all things past present and future he will be faithful to his promise if there is infidelity it can come only from his human creatures if indeed there should be his mercy is still there to extend forgiveness but by reason of the intention that you already have and will soon publicly express in your first profession and the renewal of that profession on the part of those to renew today part of your renewal is a, an expression of your unqualified intent namely to be faithful to these espousals into which you are about to or have already entered that particular aspect needs to be part of your daily life as far as you are concerned it should be always a case when tempted so never 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 Lord will I be unfaithful to you who are faithful to me that attitude alone that disposition gains you wonderful strength and assistance in any and every kind of trial God is faithful and will never go back on his promises but it never happened that you will be unfaithful to him and another final ask or two further aspects of this spousal relationship with him has to do with the fact that the spousals are eternal not just until death do us part but, but eternal as the text says I will espouse you to me forever those two words in particular fidelity forever and then love and mercy the other two the other pair of qualities of this love of God for you which in which he shares these qualities with you to give you and confirm you in all your hopes of being true and faithful until death the church is indeed in some of its members is experiencing great infidelity here we say this not in any judgmental way it is not our place but it is nevertheless a cause of sadness within the church even amongst many of the laity who see it and ask questions about it it is precisely to overcome any such tendency of going along with what has happened so frequently in the last decade or two of years that we want to place our sights correctly this morning and that even though you know that year after year you will be coming back or at the end of your annual retreat will be renewing the vow and the promises that the intent now and throughout the rest of your life needs to be forever espousals forever and the final benefit from this kind of espousals is also found in the text and it says you shall I will espouse you in fidelity and you shall know the Lord again the flavor of the original language here is precisely this to know means to know intimately in natural marriage we know what that means but we're sp speaking here of the spiritual nuptials which far transcend mere natural marriage with its imperfections it means that just as Mary knew the Lord intimately bore him in fact within her and not just became his mother according to the flesh but and this is where our Lord extolled her that she was indeed his mother in the spiritual sense because she did the will of God those who do the will of my father they are my mothers and brothers and sisters as he proclaimed to the public on more than one occasion so then think of that benefit you shall know the Lord you shall be in on his secrets you will share them you will witness things that happen sometimes even by insignificant 
apparently insignificant acts on your part, efforts that you make, and wonder at the effects. Many of the effects you may never even know in this life. Sometimes we hear about great things that have happened to an individual and we say, well, yes, I know that individual. And what happened? She did that? Does she know it? I don't know whether she knows it, but that's the influence she had on me. I heard that just the other day. How did California ever arrive at getting what is now about to be established as a canonical group? One young missionary, young at the time, was willing to go to the unknown mission country of California. And this is her 25th anniversary. I'm sure you don't mind. We're getting slightly personal. He went, dared to go to California at the invitation of a friar whose name is well known to the Californians, Alfred Baedeker, and was told she would have work, no guarantee of any great pay, of course, but that she would have work and could there make the Institute known. Well, she really went to the unknown in order to make the Institute known. And it was difficult and hard, and for a while it looked like, will the seed brought to California ever get beneath the surface? But it does take seed a long time to get down below the surface, to be watered, to be nurtured, and eventually to show fruit. And certainly there is fruit there. We're looking at much of the fruit. Not all, because there's still great strength out there that we'll see from time to time. But an example, and just one, because these examples could be multiplied in, in relation to all of you. If we single out one because of the special occasion, it is just by way of example of how the Lord uses you after having made himself known to you so that you do believe and you love. And uh, he begins to become known and to grow in the lives of those to whom you have witnessed concerning his dwelling within yourselves. The rest of the readings have much, of course, upon which we can from time to time reflect. It is just one instance of six lines of the scriptures that have helped us to understand something of the beauty and the depths of the faith and the love, the fidelity, the other aspects of this kind of nuptials which are being enacted in your very presence. This is a faith-filled gathering and it's because of your faith that you have enjoyed so much love during these days, manifested it, that you'll have ever so much more in the days ahead. May God indeed grant to all of you these virtues of fidelity, of firm faith, of total and undivided gift of love, and then of the intimate knowledge of your spouse, who will guide you through life and bring you to the threshold of eternity, because your spouses with him are eternal. Amen. Amen.
Pray for us. 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 Pray for
of God and the mercy for God, not the deeds for God, they do for your sake alone, but they know you want them to do. And always you want what pleases you. May they be purified in soul, interiorly enlightened, and inflamed by the Holy Spirit, to follow in the footsteps of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and thus come to you, Most High, by your grace alone, who in perfect trinity and in single unity live and reign and are glorified, Almighty God, forever 